Well, after almost 90 hours of gameplay and catching all 242 Pokemon, it is finally time for tips and tricks I wish I knew earlier in Pokemon Legends Arceus. As usual, we have stuff for beginner players ranging all the way up to more advanced players of the franchise. So without wasting any time, let's jump right into it. To categorize this a little bit, let's start off with some tips about Jubilife Village itself. The first thing that the game doesn't actually tell us is that there is a multiple release function at the pastors. This means when you've got a bunch of useless Pokemon in your box that you have to capture to level up your tasks, and you want to get rid of them, usually you have to release them one by one, which can be a real pain. Luckily, there is a hidden function that will allow us to release multiple Pokemon at once. All we need to do for this is completely fill up four different boxes in the pasture full of Pokemon. They can be any Pokemon, they can be all the same if you want, but they must be full, complete four boxes. Once you do, and then you leave the village and come back and speak to the NPC at the pastures, you should see down in the bottom right the option to select multiple Pokemon for release. This is extremely useful, especially the more you move on through the game. The next thing the game doesn't really do much of a good job explaining to us is the harvest system. So we can harvest different materials at the farm, starting off with just some basic stuff like apricorns, and then later on in the game, after we finish all of Miller's side quest, we can actually expand the farm to have four plots, as well as harvest better items such as nature mints at the end. A lot of people have the question of how long does it actually take these materials to fully grow and come back and harvest them. Well, in this game, it doesn't actually go by time, it goes by Pokemon Court. So for example, if we plant an Apricorn Harvest, we need to go out and catch 8 Pokemon for the harvest to be ready. They can be 8 Pokemon, you go out, capture them, come back, and the harvest should be ready to pick up. This also goes for the harvest based on medicine. Then for vegetable and mushroom harvest, we need to catch 12 Pokemon. For berry harvest, we need to catch 16 Pokemon. And then finally, when we unlock the mint harvest, if we do that, we need to catch 20 Pokemon before the harvest is ready. Definitely try to stay on top of your farm as much as you can, even if it's just to get apricorns so you don't have to spend money on materials or Pokeballs. Next, let's speak about the merit points a little bit. There's going to be an NPC here in Jubilife Village that will trade our merit points for evolution items for our Pokemon. Merit points are obtained by finding these lost satchels around the world. They can either be from NPCs or real life players who have died and fainted in that spot. And once we retrieve them, we'll be rewarded with merit points, which like we said, we can exchange for evolution items for our Pokemon. Which is kind of okay, because people have been complaining for a long time that not everybody has friends to trade their Pokemon to evolve them with, which is a nice feature. However, this next part may seem obvious to so many of you, but for me, I really didn't realize until really late on, this doesn't actually void the classic trade-in system. You can still evolve Pokemon that require trade-in by actually just straight up trade-in without the need of buying a cable link. So if you do have a friend, definitely don't waste your money buying the cable link items. You are going to spend a lot of time in this game moving items back and forth between your satchel and your storage box. And it's not actually a hidden function, but there is an option here to directly move it all at once with just one click of a button instead of having to click move and then select how many you actually want to move. You can simply press the X button on one and it will directly move all of that item over to the satchel or vice versa. Which for some reason I didn't see this option until many hours of gameplay. Something else many people overlooked is once you've advanced a little bit through the story, there's actually an NPC in the village who sells XP candies. They are a little bit expensive, but money isn't too much of a problem once you get into late game, so you can just actually buy your way up to high levels on this game. Speaking of leveling up without even leaving the village, you can actually re-challenge any of the important NPCs you have fought throughout the story by speaking to the person on the left at the battlegrounds. I promise there's one more thing before we leave the village and we can finally get into the good stuff. Don't ignore your effort levels, they are a huge help. They're kind of equivalent to IV EVs, let's say, from previous games, even though they are quite a bit different. These are permanent stat boosts that we can give to our Pokemon by using the Grit Dust, the Gravel, the Pebbles, and finally the Rock. With these, we can choose to level up individual stats of each of our Pokemon all the way up to level 10. We have a full video explaining effort levels if you really want to check that out, it's on the channel, but it's fairly straightforward. And while it's not necessary, as there's no PvP or competitive in this game, at least of yet, but hey, who doesn't want their Pokemon to be as strong as they possibly can? And with that, we're going to smoothly transition on to how to farm grid items. A really good way to get grid items, other than just simply defeating Alphas, is through releasing Pokemon. However, if you just go out and catch a bunch of level 5 Subats, you're probably not going to get many decent grid items, maybe a few dust here and there. The best thing you can do is catch high level Pokemon and release them for better grid items. What we can do is in these distortion zones, when they're about to open, we get a bit of time before they actually activate. What you want to do in that time is hide in the tall grass before it actually activates the zone and the Pokemon starts spawning in. This way, once they spawn in, they won't just directly aggro onto you and they won't see you. And from the grass, you can just spam a bunch of Pokeballs at them and just catch everything without them even seeing you really, really easily. 
And obviously, you're not going to have a 100% catch rate. Some of them will get away, but it's still a very, very efficient way of catching a bunch of Pokemon, which are usually really high leveled. So then we can just simply release them back at the pastures for some great grit items in exchange. This is generally just a good tip for the distortion zones if you're trying to catch any of the Pokemon in that zone specifically. Because usually to catch them, you are going to have to start a fight and usually there's at least like two or three next to each other and it can be very, very chaotic in there. If you like that tip, you're definitely going to like the next one, which is another great way of catching alpha Pokemon without even the need of fighting. For that, we are going to use items called Sticky Globs. These are by far the best item hands down in the entire game. If you throw three to four of these sticky globs at an alpha Pokemon, it will sort of stun them for a little while. After stunning the enemy, we'll realize while locked on that the red cross, meaning that we can't capture them, will change to a yellow icon, meaning they are available for capture. So this way we can just throw three or four sticky globs, then switch to a Pokeball and capture the alphas without even fighting them. If you want to increase your chances even more, while they're stunned, you can quickly run around behind the Pokemon and throw the Pokeball to get a critical capture from behind. The sticky globs recipe is sold by the craft shop itself for 10 or 20,000, I believe it was. And when you get to late game, you can actually buy these from the general store at Jubilife Village by simply doing all of his requests. In most games, we usually have to separate one tip for farming XP and another one for farming money. However, luckily for us, in this game, they're actually both pretty much the same. There's one really good method of farming both things at once. All we need to do is defeat the Alpha Blissey at the Obsidian Falls inside the Obsidian Fieldlands. We can find this Alpha Blissey right here where we've shown you in the gameplay. Ideally, for this to work efficiently, I would recommend having a strong fight type Pokemon, such as Infernape, who can one-shot Blissey. As far as how much XP you actually get, it depends on what the level difference is between your Pokemon and the Pokemon you defeated. So if you come here with a level 60 Pokemon, you're going to get anywhere around 8,000 experience points per defeat. And then, for example, if you bring along a level 4 Pokemon, which doesn't even fight, just have him in the team, he can go all the way from level 4 to 25 in one fight. It is insane the amount of XP they get. It doesn't just end there. The Alpha Blissey also has a very high drop rate for large experience candies, which is even more experience we can feed to any of our Pokemon. As well as almost always dropping some sort of grit items. And even when they don't drop large XP candies, we get something equally as good. We get Seeds of Mastery, which, apart from being really good just for mastering moves quicker, you can actually sell for 3,000 apiece. So like we said, if you go in for just cash, you can just sell off the XP candies and the Seeds of Mastery at the end of it and take a bunch of cash home. And if you want the experience, you can get the experience plus the large candy and then sell the Seeds of Mastery and buy more XP candies. And as it is a fixed alpha spawn, all we need to do is go back to Jubilee Village, come back to the Heights camp and fly over and it will respawn over and over again every single time. This is just a great farming method for whatever it is you need in the game. Another thing you definitely want to keep her out for in late game are the bandit sisters that are throughout the world. They do have fixed spawn locations, though it's random which ones they're going to be at, but if you ever see them around the world, definitely get close to them and it will start a Pokemon fight. You're not going to get great XP as they only have one Pokemon each, but when you defeat each one of them, they give you four nuggets. Each one of these is going to sell for 10,000. Meaning each time we defeat one of these sisters, they're going to give us 40,000 gold pretty much by just selling these items. They're going to constantly respawn in different locations, so just keep your eye out for them anytime you do see them around the world. Another quick side note for maybe more beginner players, if you ever see like farming materials on higher ground or even satchels which you can't reach and you really want them, you can actually just throw your Pokemon up to the high ground and it'll fetch it for you without the need of you having to climb up, just in case you haven't yet unlocked the climbing mount in the game. Before moving on to the combat tips, let's talk a little bit about shiny hunting. We're not going to go too in-depth about shiny hunting as people have made really good videos about that already, which I would recommend going to check out. But let's go over a quick summary of what actually increases the chances of shiny spawning in this game. Well, the first thing we can do is reach level 10 of that Pokemon specific entry. That way, that Pokemon specifically will have a higher chance of being shiny without affecting the shiny rates of any other Pokemon. The second thing is once we get all of the Pokemon entries to level 10, we'll get a thing called the Shiny Charm. When we carry around the Shiny Charm, there's a higher chance of all of the Pokemon being shinies. And then finally, the next thing we can do to increase the chances even further of a specific Pokemon being shiny is complete all of the tasks inside that Pokemon's Pokedex. Which doesn't mean just level 10, it means complete every single task in that Pokemon's entry to be able to get even higher chances. So when you combine all three of these things and go into an outbreak, if you're lucky enough of that specific Pokemon, where 25 of that Pokemon spawn, there's pretty high chances of you finding a shiny of that Pokemon. Two other things you do need to know about this. If you save before going into an outbreak, it won't actually change the chances of you getting a shiny. Whether there's a shiny or not is already decided in the queue before you even start spawning the outbreak. And the second thing about the save feature is that if you do happen to see a shiny in the wild, save game before you encounter it, you can actually reload your save file and the shiny will still be there as long as it's already spawned. When it comes to shinies, there's actually a couple of really useful things inside the menus themselves. The first thing, which most of you have probably already done if you played any other Pokemon game, is turn off autosave. It just doesn't make sense to have autosave in a Pokemon game. 
that one goes a little bit without saying, but the second thing not many people do is, if you are specifically going for shinies, is turn the music all the way down and turn the effect sounds all the way up. This obviously ruins a little bit of enjoyment in the game, but it's definitely going to make hearing those shiny appearances a lot, lot easier. And if you're someone who does like getting immersed in the game, you can also have an option down here to toggle your hood off and on, which is really good for taking screenshots and stuff like that, or just to enjoy playing the game without so much clutter on your screen. Once you have this option activated, you can toggle your hood on and off by clicking down the right analog stick, the R3 button. Right, it's finally time to move on to some combat tips. The next thing is actually explained in a tutorial, but I didn't really take much notice of it until a little bit later on in the game, is that you can press the Y button to see the action order. This is very similar to if you've played anything like Final Fantasy X, where you can see what order everyone's going to act in, so you can sort of plan around that. And that way you can see if you're going to use an agile move, will it actually give you a second turn at this turn? If you use a strong move, is it going to give the enemy two turns? Stuff like that just seems like you should always have it on the screen to know exactly what's going to happen. Then inside the fight menu, when you're choosing your attack, you can press the Y button. This has been similar in pretty much every Pokemon game. And you can see a description of that attack, as well as how powerful it is and the accuracy of the attack. Also, it will tell you if that attack is super effective against that type or no effect at all. So there's no reason to not have this active all the time unless you just want to have a clearer screen while you're fighting, I suppose. If you are new to the franchise, or even if maybe you're a little bit more advanced, as there's so many different types now, um, if you need a type chart of what type is good against what, usually you just sort of Google it. But on this game, we actually have a type chart in our tips menu. If we come over here to the survey tips, we can actually see the type chart of what's good against what. If you want to check that out at any point in the game, it's kind of cool to have it in-game. Again, this next tip is a bit more for newer players out there, as most advanced players probably already know about this one. But there is a thing called Stab, which is same type attack bonus. So for an example, let's say that a water type attack such as Bubbles was used by a water type Pokemon such as Vaporeon, it would get a small bonus for being the same type. But then let's say if Vaporeon used another attack that was normal type, even if it had the exact same attack stats as Bubbles, it would do less damage because it doesn't share the same type with the Pokemon using it. That's in every Pokemon game, the game never explains it to you, but it's something that most people should really know. Another thing in this game, when you defeat one Pokemon, you don't get the chance to switch out for another one. However, the main reason for that some people don't realize is that you can actually trade out Pokemon in this game pretty much for free without losing your turn. Let's say if they pull out a water type against your ground type, you can actually switch your Pokemon out to an electric type, for example, and not really lose your turn, even if it's in the middle of combat. There is a chance if the enemy is really fast or uses an agile style attack or quick attack, in that case you will sometimes lose your turn when trading out Pokemon, but for the most part in an average fight, you can usually change out your Pokemon pretty much for free without losing your turn. One last thing in combat, I'm sure many of you noticed, Pokemon such as Eevee, a lot of them, as soon as you get in the fight with them, they run away on the first turn before you even get a chance to attack them or throw a single Pokeball at them. That can be very annoying in this game. The way to avoid that is that if you actually start the fight by hitting them in the back with the Pokeball, you will always, always go first, which means they won't get a chance to run before you take a turn. You get at least one turn this way. That is it for tips. There's a few extra things we're gonna just throw in here because I thought they were kinda cool. Most of you have probably realized by now that you can actually summon all six of your Pokemon at once into the field just to sort of hang out with them or whatever. But if you throw one of your Pokemon at another one of your Pokemon who is already summoned, they actually interact with each other instead of just sort of interacting with you, which is kind of cool. Also, when you interact with them with A, it's kind of like an affirmative, sort of happy situation, but you can actually interact with them by pressing B, which is kind of a little bit different. It's kind of like a sad, confused sort of interaction. I don't know, it's just kind of cool that they've included that in there. And also, you can actually see the different sizes of the Pokemon. If you catch a Breezel that's 2.8, for example, just a random situation, or one that's like 1.2, you can actually see physically the size difference when they're out in the field, which is kind of cool. So that is it, guys. I hope you did learn something in this video. As usual, if you have any extra tips, definitely leave them in the comments down below. They're greatly appreciated. I hope you did find this video helpful. If you did, don't forget to thumbs up button, subscribe for more content coming very soon, and we'll see you next time.